Hey there boys and girls, Mr. Marek again with another video on thermodynamics. Remember thermodynamics is the study of the microscopic energy of the particles that make things up. In this case we're typically studying gases. So in this lesson what we want to learn about is how we get gases to do work. Like for instance we know that gases have a lot of kinetic energy due to the motion of all the particles that make them up. So we've got this picture, which we kind of refer to as the kinetic model, which is basically um, the particles that make up a gas moving around at random, and that motion lets it have kinetic energy. So what we would like to do today is answer the question, how do we turn that kinetic energy into useful work? Like how can we take something that's hot and therefore has a lot of kinetic energy and make it do work in lifting something or moving something that we want to move. Um, such a device would be referred to as a heat engine. And to kind of give you a little bit of foreshadowing, you probably rode to school on something that was a heat engine. A car, a bus, motorcycle, maybe if you're really rich you have a helicopter, I don't know. But they're all examples of heat engines. So, the trick is to make the gas do work by expanding. When a gas expands, it's going to give some of its energy away as it expands. So, here's the trick. Instead of having a container, which is rigid, we're going to have a container that's got a movable top. So, in this picture, I've drawn a cylinder that has a movable top, which we're going to refer to as a piston. It's a very typical term, and if you know anything about cars, cars have pistons. Maybe you're starting to connect a few dots here. So if the pressure inside the cylinder, that is the pressure of the gas, is larger than the pressure outside the cylinder, then we're going to have a net force on the piston directed upwards. So let's suppose in this picture the pressure inside my gas cylinder is two atmospheres. Of course, pressure outside would be one atmosphere. That would indicate or that would lead to a net force that is directed upwards. Now, if the piston's not free to move, well then that's kind of boring and it doesn't really do anything. It's just a, um, a large force that the container has to overcome in order to stay rigid. But when the piston's able to move, now we can do work on it. So because the piston moves some distance d, the gas is doing work on it. Remember work is force times distance. Now what's going to happen to all those atoms, particles, whatever, that are inside the gas, that make up the gas? Because they had to give some of their energy away in pushing the piston up, on average those things are going to slow down. So if we compare the picture on the left with the picture on the right, the picture on the right shows the particles moving slower, which means they've cooled down. What that also means is that as the piston goes up, the pressure inside is going to decrease. So if you kind of remember your ideal gas law and how those three variables, pressure, volume, and temperature, are related, made the volume bigger but at the expense of lowering the pressure and the temperature. So let's zoom in a little bit on the walls of the container and see if we can learn anything. First let's consider the fixed sides of the container. Particle of mass m and velocity v hits the side and it rebounds at the velocity v because it doesn't lose any energy in the collision. It doesn't lose any energy in the collision because the wall doesn't move. So energy's got to be conserved in this collision. Remember, they're always elastic. And so because the wall doesn't move, that particle retained all of its energy. Now, if instead we consider the movable piston, and we consider the same collision that's about to happen to it, because the piston moves up a little bit, that means it's 
had work done on it, then the particle is going to slow down. So the particle in this collision, because the piston is free to move, because that particle gave away some of the energy in moving the piston, it's going to go slower and it's had lost energy. So the next question we might ask is, how much work was actually done? Well, if we could measure the, or excuse me, the kinetic energy of those particles before and after the collision, we could add all the energy differences up, and that'll tell us how much work is done. But that's not really practical in terms of measuring. So we're going to approach it more in terms of forces and distance. So if the piston on the cylinder moves up a distance d because of a net force f, then remember work is just force times distance parallel, which those force and distance would be parallel to each other. Also remember that force is pressure times area. And then lastly, remember that area times height gives us volume. And so because that distance d represents a change in height, then we can more easily write this like work equals pressure times change in volume. You may remember the pressure and volume change uh, from Bernoulli's equation. That's what does work on a fluid moving through an enclosed pipe. We see the same kind of thing here. Pressure's doing work, the change in volume tells us how much work the pressure's done. Now here's something that's real important to understand. When the piston moves up, it's because the gas is doing work on it. So the gas is losing energy as it expands. For that reason, we're going to put a negative sign in front of the P delta V to indicate that the gas inside the cylinder is losing energy as the piston rises. So when delta V is positive, the work done by the gas is negative. It's losing energy. So let's investigate that a little bit more. Why did I put a negative sign in there? The gas is going to be defined as our system. So remember, whenever we do energy, it's important to define the system. And it's doing work on the surroundings. That means that the internal energy, the kinetic energy of all those little particles, is decreasing. So when a gas does work on its surroundings, that makes its energy go down. It may be helpful to draw one of those LOL chart things. The gas is our system. Remember, we can ignore gravity because gas particles are really, really, really small. So we're just going to have gas as our system in this case. And the only kind of energy that it has is the internal energy, the kinetic energy of the particles moving around. So remember, U in this case represents internal energy. Initially, our gas started out with lots of internal energy, but it did some work in lifting up the piston, and so now it's going to end up with a little uh, internal energy. Energy still got to be conserved, so the amount of energy that we started with, minus the amount of work done, has to equal the total energy that, we've, that we end up with. And so that's why we have to keep that negative sign in the work equation. Work equals negative P delta V. This kind of as a simple reminder, remember that the internal energy of a gas is given by 3 halves nRT, and so as we lose internal energy, we're also losing temperature. So that's the measurable thing about a gas, is its temperature. And so we go from high temperature here to low temperature, because all that internal energy was used to do work in moving the piston. So let's take a real simple example. Suppose we have four moles of an ideal gas which is heated to 400 Kelvin in a 0.1 cubic meter cylinder which has a movable piston on top of it. 
we let this thing expand so that the cylinder now has a volume of 0.3 cubic meters while we hold the pressure constant. So one thing you might think of is how do we actually do that? Physically, what would you do to keep the pressure in there constant? The question here, however, is just how much work did we do, did the gas do, on the piston? So our equation is work equals negative P delta V. So the negative sign is part of the equation. We don't know what the pressure is yet, but I know that the volume change is 0.3 meters cubed minus 0.1 meter cubed. So we have a volume change basically of uh, plus 0.2 cubic meters. To find the pressure, I can use the ideal gas law, which hopefully you remember. That's the PV equals NRT thing, by the way. Solving that for pressure, we have four moles of gas. R, the um, ideal gas constant, is 8.31. And then the temperature is 400. Divide that by 0.1. We give us a pressure of 1.7 times 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. So plugging that in right there, doing the multiplication, we give us 3.4 times 10 to the fourth. And then let's check the units and make sure the units work out right. So just writing them down, I've got Newton times meter cubed over meter squared. So the meters cubed and the meters squared will cancel out, leaving just a meter on top. And so we would get Newton times meter, which is a joule, which makes sense. Work should be done in joules. And so negative 3.4 times 10 to the fourth joules means that the gas did 3.4 times 10 to the fourth joules of work on its surroundings. So basically lifting up the piston. That's a pretty significant amount of energy right there. So two things you might ask yourself, and we'll get into this next time, is one, how do we keep the pressure the same as we went from 0.1 cubic meters to 0.3 cubic meters? And two, what happened to the temperature as we kept the pressure constant but increased the volume? Two things to think about um, to get yourself ready for our next lesson. Um, what happens if we actually do work on the gas? Like what if we turn this arrow for net force around? That could happen if the pressure on the outside is greater or if there's an external force applied to the piston. So we go from the picture on the left to the picture on the right, which means work done is on the gas, work is done on the gas by the surroundings. That means the gas gets compressed or squeezed. Now remember in our first unit on fluids, we assumed that ideal fluid was incompressible. Well, gases are compressible. They can be squeezed like they can here. That's going to cause it to gain energy. So now work's being done on it. We're going to speed up the particles, which means the temperature's going to go up. This is actually something you can do if you have a big bicycle pump. You can hold the um, air nozzle like on the back of your hand, which is kind of sensitive to temperature. If you push the handle on the pump down slowly, the air feels cool. If you push it down rapidly, like you quickly do a bunch of work on it, then the air feels a little bit warmer. And we'll see some examples of this in class. Last question, what happens if the pressure is not constant? Like we have this equation, work equals negative P delta V, but in order for this to actually be an equation, the P has to be something that's not changing. It has to be a constant. Well, we have a workaround for when it's not. If the pressure is changing over time, if it's variable, then we're going to use a graphical method. Basically, we're going to find the work under a pressure versus volume graph. We're going to see lots of these next class. If you graph pressure versus volume, and the graph looks something like that, then the work done is just the area under the curve, under that graph right there. And so all I have to do is break that up into like two
um, shapes a triangle and a rectangle and calculate the area to find the work done. We'll see examples of this, but first we'll get more familiar with a pressure versus volume graph and what it represents. So if we haven't seen this idea before, don't fret. That's what we're going to do basically all next class period. So kind of just know that fact for right now. The area under a pressure volume graph gives us the work. Okay, so here's your question to think about for next time. We talked a little bit in that one example about how do we control the pressure and keep it constant. What happens to the temperature in that situation? So your general question to think about is how do you actually control when a gas does work? Like what physically, what would you do to cause a piston to expand due to a gas that's hot or something like that? Till next time, ta-ta.